Okay, very good. Okay, so good uh, good afternoon, I guess, or good morning still for some of you. Um, so today is the capacity building uh, segment uh, of the ESCAP regional consultation uh, on harnessing trade for sustainable development. So it's um, uh, the purpose really is to introduce you, you know, some of the capacity building tools uh, and courses that we have at ESCAP uh, that may be uh, useful uh, to you, right? Uh, for trade policy making, uh, trade policy analysis, and so on. So I will uh, start with giving you uh, an introduction and update on the uh, ESCAP online training courses that we have or that are upcoming as well, so you know what's coming. Uh, and then my colleagues uh, will then uh, present some of the uh, online tools uh, that we have. So Alexei uh, Kravchenko is going to talk about TINA, uh, our trade intelligence and negotiation advisor, uh, Witada uh, Anupun Wataka is going to talk about Riva, our regional integration and value chain analyzer. Uh, very advanced tool, both of them, uh, and that uh, that are still in development, right? So all anytime you have suggestions or comments, you, know, you can put in the chat, uh, and then we can see. Uh, also, also any questions that comes to mind. Right? And then the last segment of the uh, of the session will be by uh, Su Yun Kim. Uh, which is going to present uh, our trade facilitation tools, uh, in particular the UN Global Survey and also the readiness assessment, uh, online readiness assessment, assessment tool that we have for cross-border people in trade. So uh, with no further ado, uh, let me start with my uh, presentation. So let me try and uh, share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see my uh, screen. So as I mentioned, uh, what I'm going to do is give you a brief overview and introduction uh, to SCAP trade policy negotiation uh, and facilitation e-learning courses. Um, this started a few uh, years ago, two or three years ago, we started ramping up a number of our e-learning courses. And so now we have uh, 10, either already available or under uh, development. So uh, the characteristic of the e-learning courses that we have is that they are completely free um, and, uh, and they are completely self-paced. That means you can take them at any time. Uh, you just go to the course page uh, and start taking them. And once you've gone through the material, uh, you, can, uh, you can take the quiz and, and the test, right? And they are directed at government officials uh, from relevant live ministries, in particular trade ministries, obviously. Also, analysts uh, working on uh, trade issues, uh, as well as professors and students, because some of the courses are actually quite advanced uh, in terms of um, analysis. Right? So, on this slide, you can see the, the list. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, to really go through uh, each of them one by one, um, so, so you have a better idea about what's available. Um, the typical format of our e-learning courses is quite simple, right? It's video lectures, so typically short, 10 to 15 minutes uh, uh, video uh, lectures. So, and then it's accompanied normally with a handbook or a guide, a written guide or some, something you need to read. Uh, then we have quizzes uh, and exercises that you can take. And if you pass those quizzes and exercises, uh, then you can obtain uh, a certificate and, uh, from, from UNSCAP and some of the partners uh, with which we are, uh, we're working. So uh, it can, uh, and then we, we actually keep a strong record of the certificate. So you can actually go online and find your name uh, and, and a recall of your certificates, uh, you know, several months or years down the road, no problem with that. So um, we have, we really cover a wide range of topics, right? So I'm really going, I'm going to go one by one. Uh, on, on term of negotiation support, we have a course uh, now on negotiation of comprehensive economic partnership agreements. Uh, so this is a, a short course, quite introductory course, uh, done by uh, Henry Gao uh, from management, uh, from the Singapore Management University. And so the idea of this course is really to go beyond just negotiation of tariffs, right, which is at the core of RTAs, but to look at um, chapters in economic partnership agreements right, that are more complicated, SPS, TBT provisions, investment provisions, services provisions, and, and e-commerce provisions. So this is uh, what is covered by, uh, by the course. And the course can be completed in about eight hours, uh, so it's not, um, it's not too long to, uh, to go through the course and, and obtain a certificate. 
uh, a more advanced course, and then we will play one the first module of, of that course uh, later on. Uh, it's a course on negotiating regional trade agreements for trade in times of crisis and pandemic. So this is really a, a, a brand new course. We just pilot tested it. So maybe some of you actually took the pilot course um, a few uh, a few weeks ago. So this is a course that is not only done by SCAP, but it's a uh, it's a, it's a UN-wide course, right, with ONTAD, all the UN Regional Commission, and also in collaboration with, uh, with WTO. The lecturer is Catherine Kuhlman from Georgetown University. Um, and then it's accompanied, the course has 10 modules, so it's quite a long course. Uh, but more importantly, it has a, a handbook, very detailed handbook of 200 pages that gives you uh, options uh, in terms of what provisions you can include in uh, future or even existing revisions of, of regional trade agreements to build resilience in supply chain. So this was developed in particular in response to the COVID-19 crisis. And so uh, we are going to uh, launch it uh, globally uh, in September, 2021, at the very end of September, 29th September. So if you're interested in this, you can, uh, you can register uh, in the coming few, uh, few weeks or few days uh, for, the, for the course. Um, aside from those two courses on negotiations, what we have is we have courses on uh, specific topics related to trade and sustainable development. So one of the courses uh, that is just out, in fact, is a course on non-tariff measures and sustainable development. This is joint, um, joint with ONTAN, so if you take it, you can get a joint certificate of SCAP and ONTAN. Uh, it's a very short course, six hours. Uh, and it's really it's based on our flagship publication, the Asia Pacific Trade Facility Trade and Investment uh, Report 2019, that really tried to make a link uh, to see how non-tariff measures are linked to sustainable development. And so one of the key findings we have in the report uh, is, is that half, about half of the non-tariff measures uh, in Asia and the Pacific can be directly and positively linked to sustainable development. Right. So it's really a matter of making sure those courses, uh, those, those uh, measures are efficiently implemented so they don't cost too much to, um, to implement. So you can take a look at, the, at that course. And so more ambitious, so this course is not available yet. It's forthcoming towards the end of the year. Uh, it's a quite a comprehensive course on trade and sustainable development goals. So it's non-technical, so not very difficult material. Uh, but uh, that course will cover uh, all the linkages between trade and the different SDGs. Uh, and this is being developed by Jan Coxen, uh, who is a professor at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. So this is coming towards the end of the year, so not yet available. And then besides those courses, what we have is uh, very technical courses. Uh, and so this is actually the courses developed uh, in particular by, uh, by the next speaker, right? Alexei Kravchenko in the team, uh, who is an R specialist. So uh, the, the course that is currently available is an online training on using R for trade analysis. So what is R? For those of you who wonder, right, it's, a, it's an object-oriented programming language, but most importantly, it's an open source free software environment. I mean, what is uh, the software that is being used uh, in many cases uh, by trade analysts is Stata. And Stata is uh, something we have to pay for. It's, it's expensive uh, and some many cases um, analysts don't necessarily have access to it or can't maintain the license. So R is a very powerful programming language that can do whatever Stata does. Uh, and so what the course, uh, this course does is explain how you can use R uh, to do a lot of the things that uh, you normally uh, you can do with, with Stata or some other paid softwares. So we're rolling out quite a number of courses related to uh, using R because again, there's quite strong demand for this uh, because it's open source uh, software and it's very powerful. So the next one that is coming up is a course on machine learning and text mining for trade policy analysis with R. Uh, so this is coming up hopefully uh, before the end of the year. And this is developed by, uh, or with, with collaboration with Ben Shepard, uh, who has been doing a lot of the training on gravity models uh, for ArtNet and for SCAP over the years. Uh, so this is very uh, useful material, useful course. Uh, and so uh, again, this is quite more technical, right? So it needs more time to complete those course, right? This one is 20 hours and the basic uh, trade analysis using our course is an estimated, estimated time to take it is 60 hours, right? So much more than some of the uh, general and the negotiation courses I mentioned before. 
Uh, also, another uh, small course, smaller course on using R for mapping provisions in trade agreements is forthcoming. And this is, uh, uh, this is a course that is um, uh, an offshoot uh, from the development of our trade intelligence and negotiation advisor uh, that Alex is going to, uh, to talk about uh, later on. So maybe in towards the end of the year, maybe early 2022. So this, again, this is more for um, uh, advanced trade policy analysts. On the trade facilitation side, uh, right now we've got two courses, two main courses. We have a very long standing. This is the first e-learning courses that we've done on trade. I believe at SCAP is a course on business process analysis for trade facilitation. Uh, so this is really a fundamental course um, that if you're interested in trade facilitation, uh, you can take. I understand Philippines customs uh, has made it mandatory for all the new customs officers to actually take that course. Uh, when, uh, when the, and, and learn about trade facilitation. So now we are upgrading this course, we are revising it, but you can still take the current one. Uh, and uh, it's available not only in English, this one, because it's uh, in demand uh, all over the world. So we have it in Chinese, we have it in French, and we have it in Russian. And it's relatively short to complete, uh, only six hours. And then the very new course we have on trade facilitation, and this is developed in collaboration with the Thailand Institute for Trade and Development. Uh, it's a course on enhancing trade information portals. So trade information portal is quite a hot topic. Many countries have been trying to develop uh, this kind of uh, trade information portals or national trade repositories to display and to show all the, their uh, regulations and their procedures to make it easier for uh, SMEs in particular to, uh, to engage in international trade. But what we found is that uh, in many cases, uh, the, those trade information portal, once they've been set up, uh, they quickly become outdated um, and uncared for. And so uh, the course really focused on, on trying to, uh, uh, to think through and provide a method uh, so that uh, those uh, trade information portals can be made more uh, sustainable. And, and more useful all the time, right? So your, this is very short course as well, uh, and you're very uh, welcome to, to take this. So, um, and then, uh, so that's the two courses on trade facilitation that are already available that you can take. Uh, and we are in the midst of developing a new course on next generation trade facilitation. So this is quite ambitious one. Uh, it's based on the content of the UN Global Survey on digital and sustainable trade facilitation that uh, Sue at the end of this session, to have the end of the session, will uh, will show you. Um, so it's really WTO TFA plus uh, in scope, right? So it's not only about the trade facilitation measure in the WTO agreements, uh, because there's a lot of materials already on this, but it's really looking at uh, measures, digital trade facilitation measures, sustainable trade facilitation measures for SMEs, for agriculture, uh, for women, and and so on. So there's not much material on this uh, yet, capacity material on this yet. So. Uh, this course will fill uh, that gap. And we hope to have it pilot tested during the end of the year, by, by the end of the year, and it will be available uh, by uh, early 2022, I expect. So I think that's it in terms of the, the courses we have. Uh, what, uh, one more course that we are going to start the development right, of uh, in the coming months is a course on climate smart uh, trade and investment for sustainable development. So this is in the planning stage. I mean, for those of you who attended the original consultation, uh, I presented uh, some of the recommendations from the report that is forthcoming uh, with UNEP and UNCTAD on climate smart trade and investment. So we will develop uh, a capacity building course based on the report uh, in uh, probably to be available uh, in April uh, or May next year. Again, with joint certificates uh, by SCAP, UNEP and UNCTAD. Uh, so uh, that may be of interest to some of you. Generally speaking, um, so as I mentioned, the e-learning courses are, are free. Uh, you can access them now. I mean, the ones that are already available, you can access them now. Uh, you can, uh, it's, they are self-paced. But what we can also do is we can, if on request, we can work with you to uh, conduct facilitated, uh, tailored, uh, national or regional capacity building events on the basis of the courses. Uh, so we've done this already in a few cases and it works uh, very well. And then we can combine this also with uh, the use or training on some of the online training tools and databases that my colleagues are going to present uh, in, a few, uh, in a few minutes. So at this point, what I'd like to do is to, uh, um, 
to welcome suggestions of additional course topics and, and formats. Uh, if, uh, if you have any uh, good ideas on this, you can put this in the, in the chat so that we can consider those as we continue rolling out uh, new courses uh, on, on trade policy, on trade negotiation and facilitation. And uh, uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of our uh, upcoming flagship, flagship course, right, with, uh, with UN, uh, other UN collaborators on uh, negotiating RTAs uh, in times of crisis uh, and pandemic, Let's, uh, let me ask my colleague to play the first uh, module of, uh, of the pilot course uh, that we had on this uh, on this issue, just to give you a flavor. Thank you very much. Welcome to the UNSCAP pilot course on negotiating regional trade agreements for trade in times of crisis and pandemic. My name is Katrin Kuhlman. I'm a visiting professor at Georgetown Law School and the president and founder of the New Markets Lab, a law and development center. This is module one, the introduction to the course. This is the first session of 10 to present a handbook developed for UNSCAP that includes options for governments and other stakeholders for tailoring regional trade agreements or RTAs to trade in times of crisis. This module will include background on the handbook and its structure, and it will be followed by separate modules on each of the handbook's nine chapters. The handbook was developed in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has strained supply chains and caused a spate of unilateral state measures, clearly illustrating the weaknesses and vulnerabilities in the global trading system and global trading rules. At the same time as the pandemic has gone on, the WTO has been increasingly focused on for reform due to the widening systemic inequalities, increasing economic diversity among members, and the massive changes propelled by technological advancement. Concurrently, we've seen a proliferation of regional trade agreements, or RTAs. RTAs have been a vehicle for deeper economic integration than has been possible through multilateral negotiations, particularly given that multilateral negotiations have stalled. Often RTAs will include something called WTO plus commitments on topics like intellectual property rights, for example, TRIPS plus commitments, which we'll talk about in the session on IPR. RTAs also touch upon issues that are yet to be addressed by the WTO and incorporate both economic and social considerations, such as environmental sustainability and protection, competition policy, digital trade, gender, and labor. These are often referred to as WTO beyond, WTO extra, or WTO X issues. As the handbook highlights, there's also the potential to integrate crisis specific provisions into RTAs going forward. And this will be a focus of the sessions that we have to come. The handbook was developed with the objective of making trade rules more resilient and presenting options for negotiators, policymakers, and other stakeholders to consider as RTAs are designed in the context of crisis and pandemic going forward. It contains nine chapters, including those that cover trade and essential goods and services, trade facilitation, SPS and TBT measures, intellectual property rights, digital trade, transparency, development, and building forward better. And in most cases, where possible, RTA options have been presented based on a methodology that I will now briefly outline and which you can see in this slide. So in most cases, we tried to start with baseline options. These are options that encompass minimum standards that have broader support. Some of the baseline options, in fact, many of the baseline options, track with the provisions of the WTO covered agreements. Then going out from there, we identified baseline plus options. These go beyond a minimum standard to establish disciplines that are particularly tailored to responding to crises within a particular issue area, building upon, however, rather than undermining global norms. And then in some cases, we identified discretionary options. These tend to expand policy space, which is all an important consideration for governments, of course, 
but they sometimes do so at the expense of trading partners or third party stakeholders and do need to be very carefully considered. There are two other types of options that we identified in the handbook. One, in some cases where we could not identify a baseline option due to lack of a consensus, for example, the varying approaches to digital trade, the handbook provides common elements and example options. In other cases where a baseline option doesn't exist, perhaps because this is an area that has not yet been covered in an RTA, the handbook includes sample model provisions. These are mainly provisions that are tailored in particular to crisis and pandemic. In all cases, with all of the options presented, we explain them carefully, looking at the possible strengths and weaknesses and considerations that stakeholders and governments should consider when looking at these options in the context of future RTAs. And finally, I want to note that some of the options are derived from a broader research project that I have led both academically and with the work of the New Markets Lab to catalog diversity and flexibility in regional trade agreements and international economic law in order to address economic and social development considerations. This is contained in several papers which were, are referenced here and in the illustrative sources at the end of this session. Before turning to the individual modules, I wanted to give an overview of the handbook and its chapters. The first chapter covers the COVID-19 pandemic and country responses. It does present how countries have responded to the crisis, assessing how policy responses could perhaps be better approached in the future, and it focuses in particular on the relationship between the pandemic and international trading rules looking at vulnerabilities that have been faced by particular stakeholders and also vulnerabilities in the system of rules itself, both of which serve as the basis for the RTA options that follow. The second chapter rightly focuses on essential goods and services and how RTAs can better ensure uninterrupted flows of trade during times of crisis. This session addresses aspects of essential goods, such as approaches to identifying and defining essential goods, export restrictions, and rules of origin. With respect to essential services, the chapter looks at procedural liberalization of cross-border movement of natural persons, mutual recognition of qualifications, and crisis-specific responses. The third chapter focuses on trade facilitation and how RTAs can help streamline cross-border trade during crisis including exploring options on expediting and simplifying border procedures and processes. It also covers digitization of border procedures, including systems for acceptance of electronic payments and documents and single window systems. The fourth chapter covers SPS and TBT measures, given the importance of these measures during times of crisis. The session assesses options on simplification of procedures harmonization and mutual recognition, and adherence to rules-based principles and risk um, assessment on SPS and TBT. Session five will focus on intellectual property rights, which has been an incredibly important topic during the pandemic. The chapter will present existing flexibilities under the WTO TRIPS agreement, as well as the calls for a broader IP waiver, which many countries have pressed for in order to improve access to COVID-19 vaccines. It will highlight other considerations related to IPRs as well, and ways in which RTA provisions balance innovation with equitable access. The sixth chapter focuses on digital trade, and the pandemic has highlighted that the importance of this topic due to the exponential growth in digital trade and e-commerce, which is a trend that is likely to continue. There is not yet consensus on international rules related to digital trade. However, many RTAs are covering this topic more and more extensively. This session will focus on RTA options related to key aspects of digital trade, namely data privacy, cross-border data flows, data localization, consumer protection, electronic signatures, and digital inclusion, which is an increasingly important topic. The seventh chapter will focus on transparency, which has been a central concern in terms of facilitating trade during the pandemic, especially due to the unilateral measures that have been prevalent. 
The session will explore RTA options to enhance transparency during crisis situations, such as publication of measures, accountability, and information sharing, looking in particular also at the interplay between RTA provisions and WTO measures in this area. The eighth chapter covers a very important topic that really cross cuts all of the chapters of the, of the handbook, development. And here the chapter will focus in particular on the vulnerabilities faced by individuals and states during the pandemic and how these connect with provisions and RTAs. In particular, this chapter will look at special and differential treatment and the emerging trend to include sustainable development in regional trade agreements. And the final session focuses on building forward better, highlighting issues that are covered in the handbook, which really deserve deeper attention going forward. These include environmental sustainability, gender inclusivity, treatment of SMEs and RTAs, investment and labor. All of these are central to building forward better and addressing the sustainable development goals moving forward beyond the crisis. And these will be the focus of future efforts to expand upon the handbook. Finally, here are some of the illustrative sources that are covered in this chapter and which were touched upon in the presentation. I look forward to seeing you for the next module. Okay, so this was just um, uh, the first module of the pilot course on uh, negotiating uh, RTAs uh, for trade in times of crisis and pandemic. Uh, and so the course, the pilot course has been very successful. Uh, there was 150 participants in the course, 110 managed to actually pass uh, the tests and the quizzes, right? So now we're going to roll out the self-paced course uh, at the end of September. So if that's of interest, uh, we will we'll make sure that uh, you have the link once we, uh, we make it public uh, and we go global on this toward the end of the, um, of the month. Uh, there is, I see one question on, um, uh, from Somesh on gravity analysis, uh, gravity modeling courses. So uh, one thing I didn't mention is uh, uh, we do have, uh, so one of, I mean, the course, the R course for trade analysis covers uh, gravity modeling, but it's just the basics of it, uh, with a little bit of uh, in-depth modeling, in-depth modeling of non-tariff measures, which is quite uh, quite specific. Uh, but one course that is upcoming, that is not in the list I went through, uh, is uh, a course uh, with Yoto Yotov, uh, who is really one of the uh, best uh, modeler, gravity modeler around, on structural gravity uh, with R. So this, again, is a course that is going to come uh, probably uh, before the end of the year. And so uh, Alex, who is the next speaker, can tell you a little bit more uh, if, uh, if there is a need uh, when after he presents uh, Tina. So I don't see any other questions here. Uh, so let me uh, hand the floor to uh, Alex uh, for his briefing on Tina. Alex? Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good uh, morning if uh, you're someplace else. Uh, let me just quickly share with you a presentation I've done covering the basics of uh, TINA. Uh, hope you all can see it. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and go to tina.trade and we select the economy that's of interest and I will start with Bangladesh. Um, so uh, as uh, per normal, uh, um, take a little bit of time to gather all the data, but you can, uh, for example, see current trade, but we'll skip the basic features and go ahead and start thinking about who we're going to negotiate a uh, trade agreement with. Um, so if we look uh, below here, you, you'll see these are the uh, major export destinations, United States, Germany, United Kingdom. And for this example, I decided to go with Russia. So Bangladesh decides to uh, set up trade negotiations with Russia and let's select and negotiate. Uh, now we can uh, look at uh, bilateral trade figures. Um, we'll see which, what is being traded, but I, I think I'll just jump into the most important feature here, and that's the generation of the offensive list. Now the offensive list really is just a list of priority products that um, 
uh, the negotiators from the side of Bangladesh should uh, concentrate on when they go and talk to the counterparts in Russia. So, and how do we do that in uh, standardized uh, nomenclature? There's uh, about 5,500 something products, but we want to really narrow it down to help negotiators focus um, uh, on what to negotiate with. And again, these, all the filters and all the features have been uh, directly requested by former and current members of negotiating teams who told us basically they manually have to do this anyway. So, okay, so how do we narrow down the filter, uh, filter these products? Uh, well, first of all, we need to make sure that Russia actually imports these products. Second, uh, that Bangladesh is already exporting them. Uh, third, uh, that there is, must be some sort of a tariff on this particular product. Um, and we have an option to skip the preferential tariff uh, if uh, Bangladesh and Russia are already part of one. And uh, also the filter on uh, whether a product has a comparative uh, uh, advantage. And uh, it's, it's a formula here. You can see Tina will calculate this for you. Uh, but essentially, if the number is greater than one, it shows that Bangladesh is particularly good at uh, exporting that product uh, when comparing to its size uh, in international trade. So let's go ahead and maybe um, the tariffs should be greater than five. You can change these filters, like I said, uh, any way you want. I'll stick to five and generate the negotiating list. And this is when Tina is doing uh, all the calculations and gathers all the data. And voila, uh, this is something that uh, used to take weeks and it's been done within uh, a few minutes. In fact, if I didn't talk, it would take me less than a minute uh, to generate this particular list. And here we go. Uh, this is the list of now only 200 instead of 5,500 products that you have to examine. Uh, so we can see here that Russians uh, now have MFN tariff of about 15%, uh, sorry, bound tariff and MFN tariff of 10% on the list of products, mostly in the textile uh, and expectedly uh, sector. Uh, we can go ahead and examine each one of these products in details. Uh, again, these are the features specifically requested by trade negotiators uh, to, to, to look at the potential of uh, these products. And we can see uh, that the value of exports uh, of, of from Bangladesh to Russian Federation have been increasing over time. We can also compare it with the top five uh, uh, economies, the other uh, big exporters to Russia. And we can see now that, uh, yes, Bangladesh is the largest exporter, followed by uh, China, Turkey, and Pakistan. Um, uh, and other useful features you can see here on uh, the uh, preference tariffs given by Russian Federation to uh, other countries as part of other trade agreements. And we can see they've given a 0% tariff to Vietnam, 0% uh, Serbia. Uh, so possibly Bangladesh decides to negotiate with Russia. Uh, they may, uh, in, in a similar matter, achieve a uh, 0% uh, tariff. Um, now, going, going back uh, to this list, uh, the most important uh, questions always ask, well, what is the effect of uh, removing the tariffs? And uh, this is where we use the partial equilibrium uh, model. Uh, we, we select all the products and we go ahead and simulate the tariff liberalization scenario. Uh, now, in this uh, scenario, uh, these are the tariffs that we have the data from uh, the latest sources on uh, World Bank websites. But if you have better data, perhaps from the uh, Tariff Commission or something like that, you can adjust the tariffs and you can adjust the new tariffs. But I'll just leave it as it is and submit and simulate. And very quickly, uh, Tina calculates that uh, the impact of removing uh, tariffs of, uh, on all those uh, products is uh, about, will be an increase of by about 40% uh, of imports of Russia from Bangladesh based on the 2019 figures. Uh, so this is, uh, you can see the biggest increase comes from this uh, particular HS code uh, going from 10% MFN tariff to a 0% uh, tariff. Uh, you can also see uh, the effect on third party economies uh, through trade diversion. So uh, if you click here, uh, you can see that these are the countries that have been impacted by uh, this trade agreement between Russia and Bangladesh. Uh, China in this particular product would lose about nearly $2 million. So here's another useful tool, uh, a useful use of TINA is that you can see the impact of uh, 
trade agreement between uh, two economies uh, that are related to you. So in this case, perhaps China would be interested in looking at the impact of the Bangladesh-Russia uh, trade agreement. All right. Uh, so, uh, so the, 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 this is uh, the impact of trade liberalization. But let me show you what happens if I uh, select a uh, different economy to negotiate with. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure this year in particular, it would be very interesting to see what happens if you try to negotiate with the United Kingdom, who just left the European Union. So uh, for the case of Bangladesh, you can see the United Kingdom is also its first, uh, third largest export destination. So let's go ahead and negotiate with uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, we would want to build a negotiating list again. Uh, I'll just keep the default filters, but uh, if you have any more information about, uh, if you need more information, just click on these buttons, but I'll just keep them default and we select a list of products for which we should negotiate with a newly minted United Kingdom outside of the EU. Uh, we can see there's about 369 products. That's that's great. Uh, let's see what happens if we simulate tariff liberalization scenario on all these products uh, and simulate. And unfortunately, it's not going to work. And the reason that this is not going to work in this particular case, as in the case with many LDC countries, is because that uh, developed economies uh, and more developed economies uh, often give preferences to the least developed uh, country, uh, con uh, countries such as Bangladesh, uh, uh, Bhutan, and many other countries in the region. Uh, what this means is that we don't actually know what will happen um, after they, they graduate. At this stage, however, you can see that the tariffs that uh, Bangladesh imports face in the UK are zero, and uh, there's there's not going to be preferences uh, gained through gain, going through a trade agreement as the things stand now. So, what we really would like to know is to, what happens once uh, Bangladesh uh, graduate, as it plans to do in the near future. So, going back to Tina, we'll click to negotiate with a different economy. And instead of selecting a partner, we will go ahead and uh, simulate a uh, preference loss. Uh, now you can see uh, this feature uh, shows you all the trade agreements to which uh, uh, Bangladesh is part of. And uh, in terms of regional block agreements, you can see uh, there's a lot of uh, agreements that have uh, preferences to LDCs. Uh, now, you would have to go a bit more carefully through that, but I'll just uh, select anything that has LDCs in it. Again, this requires a bit more uh, nuanced approach when you do this, uh, but, but I will submit and uh, simulate, and this will take a little bit more time. Uh, interestingly, this particular tool, the preference loss, uh, found another use recently. For example, both Bangladesh, uh, sorry, both Myanmar and Cambodia uh, we're facing withdrawal from the partial withdrawal from the European Everything But Arms program, and this tool managed to simulate the impact on the industry uh, because of that. But anyway, let's say Bangladesh graduates. Obviously, it's not going to be overnight. Uh, the preferences will be lost across uh, uh, a number of years. Uh, but this is uh, the impact you can see that losing those preferences uh, for at least given to least developed countries, 44% uh, of imports are likely to be removed. Uh, uh, re uh, reduced by 44%. Uh, uh, and you can see the countries here, uh, the biggest impact will be on exports to Germany, France, the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom goes uh, the fourth. Uh, so let's look. At the, uh, so basically, this means that uh, if Bangladesh graduates and does not um, sign a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom, it will lose almost 40% of its exports to the United Kingdom. And you can see the list of products uh, uh, lower here. You can see that the current tariff of zero, which is the LDC tariff, will be increased to 12%, which is the MSN rate, most favorable nation rate and the loss of $300 million, which is significant, uh, as well as all the other products. Uh, lastly, the last feature that I want to uh, show you uh, is uh, the text analysis mo modules. 
Uh, so again, uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, as with all the other features, uh, this has been uh, suggested to us uh, by trade negotiators because this is what they do as part of real trade negotiations. Uh, so in this example, I will select India. So Bangladesh wants to select and negotiate with India. Uh, and now I will look at the trade agreements. So this tab gives me uh, the list of all the trade agreements that India has, not Bangladesh, India. So from the point of Bangladesh, I want to know what India has been doing before. And I'd like to uh, tell you that this is still in a beta test version. So uh, apologies if uh, you may encounter some error or changes. We're still uh, working on it to improve it uh, based on feedback from advisors. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we can again filter uh, by implementation year, or I, I mean, when it went into force or the scope of the agreement or uh, whether it's in force or not. Uh, you can look in any of these agreements in details. For example, looking at the India-Japan uh, agreement, we can uh, look at uh, the text of uh, all the articles. Uh, we can also, for example, uh, search for um, uh, specific keywords, SPS here, and, and, and so forth. So you can examine all the, uh, all the agreement texts or you can uh, download it. Uh, now, uh, the reason we actually wanted to uh, do this tool is that uh, research that we, uh, we've seen suggests that as much as 70% of text in trade agreements is actually copy and paste. Uh, and um, here's an example. If you uh, try to compare, let's say, Afghanistan and uh, India trade agreement and India and Sri Lanka trade agreement, and you compare the selected uh, text, uh, and we, which is Tina does now, you can see that all this uh, green parts of the agreements are actually identical between two different trade agreements. Uh, one from India to Sri Lanka, one from India to Afghanistan. Uh, so it is likely uh, if um, Bangladesh were going to implement a partial scope agreement with, Ingr uh, with India, this is the text that you would expect uh, from, uh, from getting here. So this is how you would compare the uh, overall text. You can also compare it and filter by specific provisions. Uh, again, this is work in progress. Uh, but for example, if you want to look at the agreements that have the environmental provisions, you can see that India-Japan uh, trade agreement uh, has the provisions on the environment. And uh, if it's a high level, uh, deep agreement, chances are India may want to uh, include some of such provisions for Bangladesh as well. Okay, um, again, Tina has a lot more uh, to offer than this. And uh, also there's a list of features of things that we keep adding. So I encourage you to use it. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, do let me uh, and my team know. Any questions, we're happy to answer. There's, we also added the resources tab from the main menu uh, where you can find the information, including the gravity right, uh, guide, as well as uh, technical notes on some of the formulas. Uh, back to you, Jan, thank you. Alex, uh, are, you, are, you, are you done? I don't see any questions to, uh, to Alex on Tina, right? At this stage. Uh, yes, sorry, I thought you were talking, but you were talking from the video. So uh, yes, any, any questions? Uh, but basically this is the uh, quick introduction about uh, Tina, Trade Intelligence Negotiation Advisor, and we've used it successfully uh, to help negotiators in, uh, in, in Bangladesh, in Cambodia, in, uh, in Vanuatu, uh, in Central Asia, and we've organized workshops, uh, capacity training on negotiators. So we're open to to carry out uh, uh, similar workshops to teach, uh, particularly trainers, uh, how to use this tool to help the negotiating teams. Uh, any any questions out here? Thanks.
I think you're muted, Jan. Uh, if you can retrieve the course uh, we did on gravity modeling with your Toyota, right? We, we have this online so that because uh, there was a question on gravity earlier. So if we have the link, we can you can put it on the chat. Right? Uh, yeah, we have a better link. I'll, I'll share it in a second. It, it hasn't uh, basically the the courses there. The questions haven't been yet uh, run and uh, set up, but I will share what we have so far. Actually, there is a question for you on elasticities. Also, uh, that's a great question. Um, the elasticity we use are, are uh, calculated. We calculated them ourselves uh, for the partial equilibrium analysis. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, we we try to use the World Bank's uh, widths and elasticities uh, that are in the SMART analysis tool. Uh, in fact, uh, in the next version, we'll have an option where you can select those elasticity as well. Uh, but what we found is the coverage was not as great for countries, uh, and so we decided to use more up-to-date uh, uh, data to estimate our own elasticities uh, to get a better um, feel of, uh, you know, how, how trade works. Uh, but uh, in the resource tabs, there is a paper on elasticities that you can read uh, that uh, talks about this comparison. Jan, uh, there is a question that came directly to me, uh, and it's about non-tariff measures. Um, can we get some idea about non-tariff measures and importantly NTBs, um, which are in, which NTMs are imposed to prevent market access, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Sorry, I haven't seen it uh, before, so m maybe. Maybe uh, uh, it's not no, no. Actually, I, I can see. It. Yeah, I can see. It too. Right. Okay. Um, so, I mean, this is a question. I was uh, participating in an APEC meeting, and so this was uh, also on non-tariff measures not too long ago. Uh, and so that's a key question that is asked, right? Is it can we can we know the question was something like can we know the proportion of uh, non-tariff measures that are legitimate uh, versus the uh, proportion that is not. Uh, legitimate, uh, I mean, basically that are trade barriers uh, versus just uh, legitimate in terms of addressing real uh, non-trade issues. Unfortunately, I mean, there is, it's, it's impossible to do this because every country uh, has a different uh, definition uh, of, of what, is go what is legitimate, right? So the, the thing what, that, you, that you can do is, you, in principle, non-tariff measures are supposed to be science-based, right? So you need to have a scientific justification for putting up in particular uh, a technical barrier, uh, a TBT or an SPS measure. Uh, but even that, you know, science again is uh, defining a threshold, right? In terms of a risk for health, for safety, is something that is going to be different in every country. Uh, so it's very difficult to, um, um, to distinguish between an NTM and, uh, and, and, and something that is going to be a barrier. There'll be always room for discussion. Uh, what we have done uh, in, um, in APTIA in this Asia Pacific Trade Investment Report 2019 that is dedicated to non tariff measures for sustainable development. If we look to what extent uh, non tariff measures, uh, technical NTMs that are being imposed in countries, uh, uh, to what extent they follow international standards. Right? Um, and so that's normally one, the, the best thing you can do is to, to try and look to what, it, to what extent a non tariff measure follow an international standard. Uh, but again, here, uh, some countries will have views as the international standards uh, are being set mostly by developed economies. Uh, and so they may not be uh, suitable uh, for developing countries, right? So you still have a lot of uh, room for, for debate on this. Uh, the non-tariff, um, I mean, the, the course I mentioned, right, in my presentation, the course on NTM and sustainable development uh, is actually covering a little bit of this. So I would suggest you take a look at this. And maybe Alex, Alex is actually our expert on non-tariff measures, so you can elaborate a little bit if you wish. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jan. Well, uh, exactly. Technically, uh, it's a su subjective matter if it's a legitimate or not. So, uh, I mean, technically, if uh, all NTMs are legitimate unless they have been successfully uh, challenge through the whole WTO process. Uh, and uh, so far, only about out of all the thousands and tens of thousands of non tariff measures in force, only about 20 of them have come through the whole process. Uh, and, uh, you know, the process that's no longer available for most countries because the panel um, 
uh, it doesn't doesn't have people on it. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's an it's an interesting question. Uh, second part to your question, to the question online, right? On uh, can it work out the impact of tariff increase? I don't know if you read the question. I yeah, sorry, I did not see that. Uh, well, that that's one of the things that we're working on is um, uh, it's 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 work in progress. It's a little bit slower than uh, we hope. Uh, it's a little harder to, to, to work on you know, during COVID for one reason or the other. Uh, but yes, we, um, we, we actually estimated the impact of uh, non-tariff measures on trade uh, equivalent in tariff percentage points. And what we wanted to do is to add a model where you can um, simulate the impact of uh, reducing cost associated with certain NTMs. Uh, obviously, you can't remove remove all of these uh, costs. Uh, what we generally found uh, actually is that the developed countries, uh, European Union, um, the United States, even though they tend to have a lot more non-tariff measures in place, their costs are lower than uh, the cost of those non-tariff measures in the developing countries. And uh, what we uh, find is that it's mostly because of the procedural obstacles that are 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 more streamlined. Uh, and, and, and that really should be the, the, um, uh, the target of the developing countries, and that's not to focus so much on their trade partners, but their own internal procedures are usually uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest block to trade. Uh, in fact, the service uh, uh, conducted with, uh, with traders, and that's, that's also in the course that Jan uh, uh, has mentioned, is that most of the time it's actually domestic procedural obstacles. Uh, you know, it's how hard it is to get the certificate of compliance, uh, uh, how long it takes, if there's laboratory uh, available, that those are usually the main obstacles to trade rather than the actual trade partners um, legislation, which few trade find problematic. And um, uh, to a question, yeah, yeah, yes, we'll have a, a module at some stage in Tina that integrates that. Yes, but Alex, the question also was about can Tina work out the impact of tariff increase? I don't know if it's you, you saw it. I don't know whether you answered this. My, my, my understanding is that it, yes, it can work out the impact of tariff increase, right? Uh, yes, that's the module of uh, LDC graduation. Uh, so the increase right now is uh, either you have to do manually uh, when you negotiate with someone bilaterally so you'll have to manually switch it from zero to your preferred values or in case of uh, graduation uh, or losing preference then they'll be increased to mfn status uh, yes that, that but but there is no uh feature where you can uh randomly take a product and increase the tariff but uh, it's pretty straightforward to do with just an excel sheet if you're up for it we can share you uh the, the, the methodology of how to do it. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, let me see whether we missed anything, but I think it's okay. Um, so I think uh, that's it uh, for you, Alex, at this stage. I mean, maybe take a question that comes up later. Uh, but uh, maybe we can move to uh, to Riva, right? So with Tala, you can uh, start an introduction of the vision integration and value chain analyzer. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, we are going to introduce to you the online tools called Regional Integration in Value Chain Analysis, or uh, Riva in chart. Uh, what you will see is the current version, which we call Riva. 1.0. Uh, this is the value chain analyzer part of Riva because Riva has two parts, uh, regional integration analysis part and uh, value chain analysis part uh, as a second. We, we, we have launched the, the value chain part and uh, this part is combined with uh, interactive data visualization that uh, is based on the data that we collect from inter uh, country input output table and run it through the technical models called uh, 
the build the build set model, which is uh, quite technical. And the process usually take very long time from collecting data, uh, modifying the theoretical part and implement it into meaningful indicators and explain to policy makers. So the purpose of RIVA is to make all these steps automate for you. Uh, it's supposed to be useful for practitioners who want to understand the economy integration into regional and global value chains because they don't have to do the tedious part and very technical part by themselves. They can come up with a uh, very uh, easy, accessible uh, infographic and also come with uh, downloadable data sheets as well as country brief. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking, but I will show you how you would get from Riva based on the examples that we provide in this video. Hi, welcome to Reva Value Chain Analyzer. Have you ever wanted to know how much do your country's exports need imports? How much do your countries contribute to others' exports? In which sectors? And with which countries? Answers to these questions are a prerequisite. If you are going to understand how your country is connected with others in the world today. It was time consuming to find answers to all these basic but important questions. But, with Reva, it will be just few clicks if you enter into Reva and go to the GVC Relationships section. Just choose Economy and Year of Interest. For example, I put Cambodia, and 2017. In less than three clicks, you can see backward compared to forward linkages. For Cambodia, GVC participation is much more on backward linkages than forward linkages. The characteristic that tend to show Cambodia generally situates at the relatively downstream part of the value chain. If you scroll down, you will see the top five GVC sectors of Cambodia. On the backward side, the country's imports are used in the textiles value chains. On the forward side, its intermediate exports are significantly go to agricultural value chains. You can click into any of these sectors to see who are the major partners for that sector. The largest input supplier for Cambodia's textile exports is China. The largest export partner for its agricultural intermediates is Vietnam. If you go further down, you see the top five GVC partners. You can click into any of them to see what are they trading with Cambodia. For example, Germany is quite a significant partner on forward linkages. You may be curious about what is Cambodia contributing to the GVC exports in Germany? So, you just click at Germany. You see the major contribution of Cambodia to Germany exports is predominantly about hotel and restaurant. And these information hints you abhor their relationship in the value chains of tourism services. You may want to know more about the GVC relationships. Let's drill down. Reva has four more sections for you to get deeper into value chain linkages. Here, the section on structure of value added tells about what are inside a country's exports. Let's look at what are inside Cambodia's total exports. Choose Cambodia as the exporter, world is importer, and all sectors combined. Foreign value added, in green, contributes about one-fourth of total exports. The rest is generally about domestic value added. The largest part of Cambodia's exports is the dark blue. It is final assembly stage of export production that happens in the country. Light blue and red are exports of intermediate products. The red is used in further stage of GVC's export production. If we scroll down, we see cross Southeast Asian comparison. You could notice that Cambodia has relatively larger the green and dark blue than other Southeast Asian countries. 
It tells you that Cambodia's exports have high import content, and the country is more into exporting final product than intermediate product. In other words, GVC participation of Cambodia remains limit at the downstream end of the value chain. This conclusion is further emphasized in the section on participation in GVCs, where we can compare across subregion. I click into the section on participation in GVCs. I keep Cambodia as exporter, year 2017. Because I want to see its total exports, I choose world as importer, and all sectors. It shows Cambodia together with Brunei, Laos, and Indonesia, remain less presenting in GVCs than other ASEAN. The major difference between Cambodia and the other three is the components inside their GVC participation. For Cambodia, foreign value added, the green one, is the major element, because the country is at the downstream end of value chains. In the other three, the GVC participation is mostly about exporting primary intermediates, which then has less to do with foreign value added. In contrast, Vietnam and other large ASEAN countries integrate more into GVCs. They add domestic value into imported intermediate and export to GVC partners. These value-added exports may come back and forth to the country at different stages of production. The GVC participation consists significant but balanced between foreign value added, in green, domestic value added, in red, and double counting, in purple which reflects the repeated border crossing of those value added. We can dig into backward linkages and forward linkages of a country. The two sections have a similar architecture. For the sake of time, I will focus on the first one and be very brief on the second one. If you still remember, we were seeing Cambodia has extensive backward linkages, especially in the textile sector. Now, I want to dig deeper. I choose Cambodia as exporter, world as importer, 2017, and export sector is textiles. The first chart shows the sources of inputs for Cambodia to produce textile exports. The blue part represents inputs sourced from Asia-Pacific partners. It accounts more than 80% of all imported inputs that Cambodia used in textiles production. China, Vietnam, Thailand are the three largest partners supplying inputs to textiles export production in Cambodia. Sometime, I may want to see the linkages with a small partner more closely. For example, if I want to find more about supply chain relationship with Latin America, which is in green can simply remove other regions like this. Now, backward linkages with Latin America appear in full screen. I can see that Brazil, Mexico, Argentina are the Latin American countries that I should focus on. If I want to do a cross-country comparison, I scroll down. I see how the share and sources of import inputs of textiles differ across ASEAN countries. Cambodia followed Singapore, Indonesia, and Vietnam in terms of the share of import content. An interesting part is now I see that textiles production in Cambodia heavily relied on intra-Asia Pacific inputs. This information may trigger my interest to explore into a specific partner. I then go up and select by source economy and put the source economy that I want to explore, such as China. Now, I see more about where inputs from China go to. More than 80% of inputs from China went into manufacturing low-tech sector, textile sector in particular. I scroll down to see cross ASEAN comparison. Among ASEAN countries, Cambodia and Vietnam are the most heavily dependent on inputs from China, but, Vietnam is connected with China in a higher tech manufacturing segment than Cambodia. I want to see what are inside this China-Vietnam links in manufacturing high to medium tech. I click the dark red. What appears tell me that the links are about inputs from China that go into computer electronics and electrical machinery sectors of Vietnam. Let's find out more about China's integration with other economies in the forward linkages section. 
I choose China as exporting economy. 2017. And all sectors. It shows. China's exports its domestic value added to export sectors of Republic of Korea more than any other. Korea absorbs nearly 7% of China's intermediate for further exports. The share is significantly higher than the second largest partner, which is Germany. Scrolling down, a cross-country comparison shows China is connected to value chains of others to all regions and its regional partners are well diversified. The most opposite within the subregion is Mongolia, of which intermediate exports are very concentrated within Asia-Pacific. You may want to know which economies are behind the heavy Asia-Pacific integration of Mongolia. Let's click and see. Most of Mongolia trade in Asia-Pacific is with China, followed by Russian Federation and Republic of Korea. To see which sectors that your economy's exports are used by value chains in a partner of your interest. You just need to go up and select by importing economy. Reva will give you sectoral components of your value added that have been included in exports by the partner of your interest, and a cross-country comparison within the same subregion. Also, Reva is flexible to support any type of users. We know a great challenge of people working with policymakers is the time sensitivity. So, we have country briefs for you. Just choose an economy of your interest and year, like this. I choose, Bangladesh, 2017. Reva will generate the country brief in a format that is ready to use. If you are a researcher you may need more flexibility to use the data for further research. You can download the data through this flexible data querying option after you created your account in Reva. For example, you might want to see value chain linkages of your economy with a group that might be your potential FTA partners. This definitely possible, by creating you economy group of interest, here. After you select indicator, economies and year of interest, Reva will generate the data set of your selection and give them as a CSV file to use in your further analysis. Reva technical note and introductory note are also available for you to understand more how to use the Reva value chain analyzer. We hope you will find our Reva Value Chain Analyzer helpful when you want to know about your economy in GVCs. Finally, we are thankful to all partners involved in Reva Value Chain Analyzer, in particular, supports from FILAC, ECLAC, and ADB. Thank you from SCAP. So uh, that is the Riva value chain analyzer. Thank you very much. Any questions on the on Riva? I don't see any question on the uh, chat uh, about Riva. And uh, Witana, maybe you can say a few words about uh, the regional integration part. Uh, yes, the upcoming part, regional integration part, is uh, going to be about uh, measuring and showing performance of country in seven dimensions of regional integration. Uh, that also includes the very new dimension that. Uh, other organizations haven't looked into it that much, which is a digital economy integration. And the special of uh, our measure is also we take into account sustainable dimension in all of uh, regional integration aspects. So uh, when we look into performance of country of trade integrations, we also accompany by a set of indicators look into how sustainable development related of those integrations. And this kind of concept apply all across seven dimensions. And we call these measurements as uh, DG3 in short, 
coming from Digital and Sustainable Regional Integration Index. So uh, it would take the same spirit on the platform like what we've seen in Riva that we will make platform interactive and easy accessible, including uh, nice infographic that uh, you can download, you can uh, see data behind and also uh, use that, that visualizations in, in the re policy report or, or accompany the policy uh, evaluations. We are going to have it hopefully by the end of this year. So that's gonna be Riva version two. Okay, and it says it asks one more question is how many how many years cover it, right? Are you talking about the version one or version two? If version can, two can... if version two it's gonna cover starting from uh 2010 until 2020. Mm, not so, bad. Okay. okay. But version two, version two is coming when this year or next year? This year is going to come this year. Okay. Hard working with Ada. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, with Ada, very much. Uh, let me. Uh, I think we can let you go. I mean, just stay in the background in case uh, someone comes. Uh, but maybe we can move to uh, to Sue, right? Uh, introducing trade facilitation tools. Thank you very much, Jan. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. So my name is Sue, uh, as introduced. Uh, I, I am very pleased to um, introduce you the three facilitation tools that ESCAP in partnership with others have developed. Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce the UN um, Global Survey on Digital and Sustainable Trade Facilitation. Uh, I would ask Kunduk, uh, my colleague, to play the introductory video first. Let me share my presentation here. Apologies. Sorry. So uh, as you saw in the video, the survey is built upon the joint efforts of the five UN regional commissions as well as the partner institutions. So um, as, as you can see in the presentation, the main objective is to monitor progress on trade facilitation, including paperless trade and other forward-looking measures towards SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. It also would, um, would support the evidence-based policymaking, capacity building and technical assistance of countries. Um, the scope of the survey 
is uh, about 50 plus trepacitation measures are included. And in 2021 survey, we have included about 140 plus countries. Um, it is built on the WTO TF related measures. But more importantly, it is building upon that and focusing on the digital sustainable aspects of trade facilitation. So when we say digital, it is um, both paperless trade as well as cross-border paper trade aspects. So it's um, the mutual recognition and also electronic data and document exchange between the borders, what we call as cross-border paperless trade. For the sustainable trade facilitation measures, it is focusing on SMEs, women, and agriculture. In addition to this, we actually have um, added the two additional trade facilitation major groups, which is trade finance, which is um, vital for um, overcoming the barriers, especially for the SMEs and some specific and marginalized groups in the global supply chains, as well as the trade facilitation during the crisis and pandemic. This uh, last one was added in light of COVID-19 pandemic, of course. However, we are really focusing on how we can ensure that future support of trade facilitation measures would be preventing some disruptions or minimizing the disruption from the crisis and pandemic, not only limited specifically to COVID-19. So for the collection of the data, we are employing three-step approach for the UN Global Survey. Uh, the first is um, including, uh, sorry, engaging the experts and other interested parties. They would be filling the questionnaire. I would like to note that the survey is on not a perception-based survey. So we would be validating and verifying and cross-checking all this data provided by the experts by desk research and further interviews. And then the final validation is done by countries. At the end of this data collection, this is, as once again, a global initiative by all uh, five UN regional commissions. So we actually consolidate the data collected by individual regional commissions and uh, incorporate into the global data. So it was launched in 2021 in July. So I would like to introduce a very brief snapshot of what have been found based on the 2020 results. So as you can see, the implementation of trade facilitation measures have been increased by over five percentage points over the last two years. This is very encouraging because there were supply chain disruptions during COVID-19 and the surge of international shipping costs has been felt in, like, in every corner of the world. So by implementing effective trade facilitation measures, countries and um, regions could actually reduce and minimize the disruptions and uh, reduce the trade cost per se. So this is very encouraging that countries are taking forward the implementation of trade facilitation measures, which could uh, potentially reduce the trade costs. Um, if we look at the implementation of different groups of TF measures, you can see quite clearly that cross-border paperless trade is a challenge. Uh, this is quite natural in a way because even if uh, a country would be equipped and be available for cross-border data exchange, unless the partner countries are ready and the uh, systems are interoperable, it cannot be exchanged. The data and documents cannot be exchanged. This is why there are uh, regional, sub-regional and global reports about interoperability and also pursuing the, um, like really uh, the cross-border data exchange in terms of like um, engaging the capacities, uh, not engaging, enhancing the capacity of partner countries as well. And also we have found, as I said, uh, the focus of the survey is on digital and sustainable. So we have found that the special and disadvantaged groups, the TF measures focusing on these SMEs and women specifically remains low. Agriculture is a bit better, but for the SMEs and women, uh, the, the implementation rates uh, remains quite low. It is also true that trade finance facilitation has the lowest implementation rates. 
And this is to be noted that we have had very low response rates from the experts in terms of traffic finance facilitation, which means there are very big rooms to improve in terms of incorporating and integrating the trade finance into the conventional um, global supply chain systems. Trade facilitation in times of crisis and pandemic was also a challenge, uh, mainly lacking the implementation of forward-looking and long-term measures about preparation for the upcoming or future pandemic and crisis. So here, the implementation of trade facilitation in Asia Pacific can be found. But the best way would be to actually explore the untfsurvey.org website. Um, for now, I will be just uh, providing you a very brief snapshot of what's available on the website. But I would be really encouraging all of you to explore it by yourselves because it's a really a visual and um, interactive website that you can play with the data as well as comparing with uh, specific economies or whatsoever. So as you can see here, the global, regional and economy data um, level of data is available. Once you click on either of these, you can find the um, implementation of different groups of trade facilitation measures are uh, uh, displayed. When you go to the economy level of data, you can actually see uh, in comparison with different survey years, as it was shown in the video, it has started in 2015 for the global survey uh, with some of the updates and some of the expansions, but you can actually compare the progress made at the economy level and as well as regional and global level in terms of the overall trade facilitation implementation rates, but also within the specific trade facilitation measures. In at the economic uh, level data, you can actually also see the individual measures, whether it's fully implemented partially or in a pilot or planning stage or not implemented at all. There will be the spider graph for each and every group of measures that shows the evol evolution and progress made in that economy in comparison with the regional and global average. So now, before moving to the readiness assessment guide, I will be asking my colleague once again to share the video on the introduction to the readiness assessment guide.
thank you. Now getting back to the slide. So, so as you have seen the snapshot of what it is, uh, I give you a little more background and introduction to the guide. Uh, I wanted to start with the background actually really, because uh, it is based on the framework agreement on facilitation of cross-border paperless trade in Asia and the Pacific, uh, simply called framework agreement or CPTA. Uh, the reason that I am focusing on this is because it's really a basis for us to develop the um, guide that I am uh, introducing, but also for other relevant and related trade facilitation activities that we are providing. Uh, this is a UN treaty um, really um, specifically focusing on achieving cross-border paperless trade or trade digitalization. It has been adopted and it has entered into force as of February 2021. So there are five parties already to the framework agreement in, and also additional several countries are working towards domestic ratification and accession in, within this year. So as, as I said, uh, this is the basis how we have been developing the readiness assessment guide and relevant work. So parties to the framework agreement needs to develop an individual action plan. An individual action plan should include concrete actions and measures with clear targets and implementation timelines necessary for facilitating cross-border paper history. So for this, we actually have had an insurance steering group and its legal and technical working groups working on developing legal and technical checklists to support the readiness assessment as a basis for preparing action plan. So when you see the legal checklist, you can see that electronic transactions and signatures law, laws regarding paperless trade systems, cross-border aspects, as well as other consideration on cross-border paperless trade related legal issues. So these are the four fundamental areas that we have been identifying and developing the checklist, as well as the guide for the legal side. And for the technical checklist, we have divided into two parts, one at the paperless trade system at the national level and uh, two national status towards cross-border data exchange. So this would include topics such as automation, ICT infrastructure, business process re-engineering, data harmonization, as well as capacity building. Then based on the checklist, the readiness assessment guide was developed as a supporting tool to facilitate self-assessment of legal and technical readiness on cross-border paperless trade. Uh, we had the contributions from the um, experts from the network called UNX and country representatives from the legal and technical working groups on cross-border paperless trade facilitation under the interim steering group. Uh, we have conducted eight country assessments already and also we are having ongoing national studies in six additional countries. All this information on the completed country assessments in terms of country reports, as well as the ongoing national studies, you can find it from this link. Now, let me uh, introduce, give a brief uh, snapshot of what you can do uh, using the uh, readiness assessment guide. So on the homepage, it has step-by-step -step approach for readiness assessment, download the checklist, plan in the assessment, follow the guides, and take the quick assessment. So first step would be you will be downloading the checklists. And this would be your answer sheet in a way when you are uh, completing the self-assessment. Then you need to plan the assessment. So we have given a very short guide about how to conduct the readiness assessment with links to all relevant pages. But um, as I have indicated, there are eight country reports completed as well as six additional countries who are in the process of conducting the readiness assessment um, study. And ESCAP is happy to provide further support within available resources. So whoever is party to the framework agreement 
or also uh, actively pursuing to become a party to the framework agreement. If you are member states of ESCOM, you are more than welcome to approach us and then request for the support for the readiness assessment. And what we would do is we would be actually providing virtual support as well as providing the support for the national and international experts team. And um, then uh, back to the guide. So when you follow the guides online, there will be the technical and also the legal guide that you can follow through. Here is a page from the technical guide, which contains explanatory notes, good practices, references, and other relevant information for each question. You can check on each question by clicking, or you can use open all option for all questions in the subsection. You can also navigate through the sections and subsections of the guide from the left pane navigation menu. So once again, I invite you all to visit the website, the readiness assessment guide and uh, find by yourself what it contains. It really contains a comprehensive and thorough information about every aspects of cross-border paperless trade uh, related matters based on the structure of the legal and technical checklist. So once you have done the, uh, completed the, uh, the assessment, or I would say um, going through the questions on the uh, checklist, what we really encourage the countries is to actually utilize it that to develop an action plan and recommendations to assist you with this, uh, developing the recommendations and action plan, we have uh, developed a quick assessment section in the guide as well, which would, you have to answer the questions and then it would be um, providing you with a list of recommendations, generic recommendations that you can use. Uh, I have to note that this list of recommendations generated from the quick, quick assessment are really general and indicative in nature. So there is a need for further elaborating and revising these recommendations with considerations of individual countries' environments and in consultation with relevant stakeholders. Uh, if you see the, um, the uh, guide, it would be very clear that which um, uh, processes would be need to take, taken, for the readiness assessment and individual and national consultation with the relevant stakeholders is a must. So this quick assessment is by no means replacing any of these. It is really just to give you a bit of um, guidance about what could be the direction and general guidelines about the recommendations which you are lacking. So this is all from me. Thank you very much. And um, I would be more than happy to answer any questions on these two presentation tools. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sue. Can you see me? Or? I can. And I, uh, I was just I, Somehow I cannot see myself. So I was getting very concerned. Uh, but anyway, I don't see any, uh, I don't see any questions on, on this. I think the audience is, is more trade policy oriented than trade facilitation, right? At this point, so it's, I'm not surprised by this. Um, I guess, you know, we, uh, what uh, I would like to say at this stage uh, is that, uh, I mean, we gave you and we gave an, uh, view an overview of the trade policy and facilitation uh, courses and tools uh, we have uh, or we are developing. Uh, and so, if uh, any of you have suggestions, you're you're uh, more than welcome to contact us, um, and uh, and then we can see how we can address uh, some of those uh, suggestions that you have. Uh, if uh, you are in academia or if you're in uh, government think tanks, or if you need uh, national capacity building uh, activities uh, related to the topics that we've covered, uh, you can uh, let us know, uh, and then we'll see how we can, uh, we can support uh, and schedule some of those things uh, possibly at the national level. 
There is a question here I can see on, could you explain if the timelines to be indicated by paperless trade council for concrete actions will be divided into categories, just like TFA device commitments into categories A, B, and C. So I think this is really to the framework agreement uh, more than the tool uh, itself, right? So the short answer, I mean, in fact, there is a video on this. Um, and so if you go to the maybe uh, two, you can put it in the, um, put the link to the framework agreement page uh, in the chat. Uh, but the third video, which is the most detailed video going provision by provision, uh, provide an answer to this. So uh, no, uh, the, uh, there is no division uh, of, of measures into categories A, B, and C uh, in the framework agreement on cross-border paper trade for the simple reason that there is really no uh, uh, category A provisions, right? Uh, in, under the paper trade treaty, every country is developing its own uh, plan of action. Uh, and it's including its own measures, right? It decides on which measures it wants to include. Uh, and it sets its own timeline. Uh, and it said, and it also decides on what capacity building, uh, building needs uh, it, it has. So all the, in a way, right? Uh, all the measures or the conclusion it will take, you know, would fit in the category B or C, right? Uh, but there is no such category uh, specific categorization because it's much more in a way than the WTO uh, TFA in that regard. Uh, the idea of the framework agreement is really as a, as a long-term planning tool, right? Uh, once you become party to it, uh, you have to uh, put together an action plan for paperless trade, for cross-border paperless trade, uh, but that, and then you need to report that action plan to the other parties, uh, but you, you have the freedom to actually update uh, this action plan and revise it uh, based on your uh, country situation, right? So revising the timelines, revising the capacity building needs, and so on. So that's really a flexible tool, uh, but there's something that can really help you plan and, and make progress. So let me uh, mention this. Uh, I see any other questions related to the presentation of Sue? I cannot uh, see up. Okay. All right. So I think thank you, uh, Sue. Uh, thank you, Alex. I know you stayed around and uh, and Witada. Uh, so I think we come to the end of this capacity building segment. Again, uh, we're very happy to uh, uh, to answer questions uh, after the sessions, um, and so just uh, uh, contact us, uh, and then we'll be uh, following up. Uh, with uh, with you individually. So uh, I thank uh, all the presenters, right? All my colleagues in the trade policy and facilitation team uh, for uh, spending their time uh, sharing uh, what, what we have. Uh, and I look forward to, uh, you know, collaboration. Uh, have a great uh, weekend. It's Friday, uh, so that's good news. Uh, I mean, in most countries, it's weekend, Saturday, Sunday, right? Uh, so enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.